where every time you triple in size, the infrastructure that you need to run the business changes dramatically. Um, and that's kind of what we've experienced last year because we went from 10 million to 30 million revenue and you know, kind of started actually putting some organizational infrastructure in place. Welcome to Growth Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? I'm Gene Hammett. I'm the host. Uh, this is formerly known as Leaders in the Trenches, but we're interviewing people that are in the front line, the trenches, so to speak, of the business growing really fast. We're focused on Inc. 500 level leaders, and today's interview is with Jan Bidhar. Jan is with Shipmunk, and really, this, this company has been on fire because they went from 15 employees to over 380 recently. They went from uh, just almost nothing to uh, a few million, then to 10 million, and then to 30 million, and this year they're going to be doing 60 million. Think about that from a trajectory of growth. So what do we talk about today? Well, we talk about the importance of having a culture of nimbleness. If you want to create a fast-growing company, you want to really embrace people that are nimble. And you want to hire them that already come in with that. You can't make them into nimble people. We talk about the specifics of that today in the interview. But what I like most about this uh, conversation with Jan is really just talking about some of the things that are uh, really important to them as far as uh, the ownership that they must take as employees. My research really aligns with this because I've talked to over 400 leaders of the Inc. 5000, and they say that creating uh, leaders that allow or inspire a sense of ownership in every employee is really critical to their growth. So I'm really excited to share this interview with you. It's Jan Bednar with Shipmunk. So here's the interview right now. Jan, how are you? Hey, Gene. I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Tell us a little bit about your company and, and what you guys do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we're uh, uh, an order fulfillment company for e-commerce, fast-growing e-commerce companies. Uh, we focus on small to medium-sized businesses and help them get the enterprise-level infrastructure uh, that they normally would need to be able to distribute their products all around the country or all around the world. Um, and we provide it to them in an easy package uh, where they would basically just ship the inventory over to us. We would do all the integration work, provide the technology to them that automates the entire process from receiving an order uh, from their website or marketplace all the way to getting the order to their customer's door. Um, and, you know, we're trying to leverage our scale by enabling them to get, you know, two-day shipping um, for a very economical rate um, to compete with Amazon and other big retailers. Well, I imagine Amazon's had a huge impact on the whole e-commerce business. Um, is that causing you to rethink technology, rethink processes, rethink marketing to, to compete against Amazon? So uh, it definitely, I mean, Amazon has been, you know, one of, I mean, the largest e-commerce player ever since uh, we were in business. I mean, long before us. Um, so when we kind of entered this arena, uh, we've never really looked at Amazon as a competitor of ours. They, they're just, it's almost impossible to compete with them. So the way we're just, you know, competing in the market, other than Amazon, um, obviously what they've done with the supply chain and customers' expectations has um, affected greatly the, um, the expectations of consumers and getting packages in two days and now we're kind of pushing towards one day has affected you know, the way we design our supply chain and uh, the way our customers expect their packages to be delivered. Uh, but I think the one interesting thing is most of our customers sell unique products. Uh, they're not, um, you know, they're not, Clorox that you were going on Amazon and buying and you really need it in one, two days because our customers sell unique products that people typically do a discovery buy for. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it could be a cat toy. It could be a subscription box for beauty. It could be any of these things. And most of our customers, customers don't necessarily have very dramatic expectations on delivery time. So although they would love to get the product, you know, in a day, um, it's very hard for a small business to be able to support getting, and order delivered in a day for a reasonable price. So most of our customers are, you know, bringing a lot more value to the table in their products so that the end consumers don't necessarily have a one day delivery expectations. Um, and they're not typically losing customers for it either if they don't offer that one day delivery service. How many employees do you have, Jen? 
Uh, at this point, we have close to 380. Okay. And you've grown pretty fast. So give us an idea of over the last three years, how fast you've grown. So about three years ago, around this time, I think we had like 15 employees. So it's been uh, kind of a nice little growth. Uh, you know, we started um, actually in a little bit of a different business in logistics, pivoted uh, in 2016 to order fulfillment and, um, you know, have been growing ever since uh, from basically zero to we're going to do about 60 million in revenue this year. Um, and we're shipping close to a million packages a month right now. Wow. That is just impressive on many levels because the, the, there's a lot of moving pieces to uh, what you've created. And that's the opportunity, right? Because there's a lot of technology and, and people involved. I, I am curious, you know, with that level of fast growth, what's been one of the things that's most important to you as a leader uh, to be able to, to handle that kind of growth? So I think uh, there's uh, one of the most challenging things is these jumps from a small business to, you know, I mean, it's still relatively a small business, but it, the incremental jumps from like 3 million revenue to 10 million of revenue and then 10 million to 30, um, it gets, um, and it's actually, there's a, there's a theory, it's called like rule of three um, or something where every time you triple in size, the infrastructure that you need to run the business changes dramatically. Um, and that's kind of what we've experienced last year because we went from 10 million to 30 million revenue and, you know, kind of started actually putting some organizational infrastructure in place. Um, and none of us really from the founding team had the experience of running or even being part of a bigger company. So it's been kind of a challenging process to truly understand like, okay, well, the infrastructure that we had a year ago doesn't work anymore. Um, now we have to hire these people to basically just, you know, another layer of management or supervisors or whatever it is. Um, so that's been pretty challenging, but kind of a fun learning process to, um, you know, go through it and really like build the infrastructure to support the growth for the next year or so. Um, and we're going through it again this year and we're going to be going through that again next year to, you know, truly understand like what does it take to operate a 60 or 100 or $200 million company? Because it's a very different business um, at every stage. It's almost like you have to reinvent it all over again every time. You know, I know you've probably heard this before through your advisors and the people you uh, are mentors in your life, but you know, sometimes the people that got you there aren't the people who get you to the next level. And that's one way that you're saying, and it's not just people, it's processes and technology, and you're going through all of that. It sounds like you've got to have a very nimble organization. Um, is that true? Yeah, 100%. Uh, and I think the, you know, one of the most important aspects that when we're hiring leaders for our organization is um, being nimble uh, is one of our core uh, values and things that we look at, um, you know, one of our, one of the main values that really we have on the wall uh, is getting shit done is kind of a, uh, you know, it sounds funny, but it's really one of the most important um, values that we have as a company, because what that truly means is that if, you know, if, if there's a need to do something, just get it done. Like, don't, you know, don't try to put it on other departments and other people or, uh, try to like overthink it because at this stage, like the only way we can be better than anybody else is to move a lot quicker. Um, and that's what really allows us to, you know, if people have that mentality of like, okay, let me just take care of this myself instead of trying to take weeks to figure it out. Um, we can be successful. So that's one of the core values. How do you reinforce that when you're hiring these leaders? So I think uh, a conversation um, about their comfort level. Like, I mean, the background is the most important thing, right? Like if somebody has been in a company that hasn't been growing or um, just been kind of more corporate structure, unless they have that mentality about them, which is rare in those situations, um, you already know that that's probably not the right fit, right? Like, but if you're hiring somebody that worked in startups in a fast growing, changing environments, somebody that embraces change and is not afraid to do things one way one week and then kind of you know completely switch around and do them a different way the next week now, i want to break in here for a second because jan talked about embracing change embracing change is really something that you want your team to do and in fact you must have them embrace change because if they are fixed mindset versus a growth mindset then they will resist all the change coming your way they will fight you they will cause stress not only for themselves, but also for you. So you want to hire people that are embracing change. 
One of the things you can do behind that is really have your hiring structure, the, the way you, you actually interview them, to uncover how they approach and see change. Now, how do you do that? Well, you've got to ask the right questions. It's not as important as what their skill is on their resume. I mean, those things are, you're not going to be looking at people uh, that are outside that category, but you want to make sure that when you're hiring people, they are embracing change. Change is not going away. Now back to the interview. Uh, those really are the people that we're looking for. Somebody that is not afraid of change, somebody that embraces change and, and you know, doesn't get upset because things change so quickly. And it's not easy to hire people for, for those kind of roles. And um, I mean, startups in general have that kind of, uh, um, you know, you need to have a certain personality to fit into a startup culture and into a fast growing startup. Like what we're dealing, it's, it's even more a, like kind of a even more crazy level than you would think because people are too used to having a complete robust structure that you kind of can't get out of. It's typically not a good fit. So having that conversation and almost presenting them like the different examples of what we've gone through uh, and being like, Hey, like, is this something you would be comfortable with? Because if not, you know, you're probably not the right guy for the job. And we try to avoid having misunderstandings when we're onboarding employees and, you know, we try to be pretty upfront because ultimately we believe that it's better for everybody if, if uh, it's clear that the candidate is not right fit for the job. Would you say that it's uh, good to be comfortable being uncomfortable and the kind of growth <laughs> that you guys have? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. When you think about um, growing the business, I'm sure you've come up with some types of emergencies or things that just didn't go your way. Does something come to mind that you could share with us around how employees kind of rallied to to really support what you were doing or what you were going through yeah yeah absolutely i mean there's uh countless examples unfortunately of what happened over the last couple of years but you know when when things went unexpectedly wrong and and the team kind of uh, got together and solved it uh the one you know the one thing that comes to mind is one of the most recent one which is also one of the most i guess brutal thing that happened um about a about a year well six months ago uh, during Black Friday, which is the busiest weekend of the year for us, uh, where we have, you know, we've processed almost 10% of our yearly volume in that one weekend. Uh, we've been getting ready for it. We've been staffing and recruiting and hiring and, you know, getting our, all of our facilities ready uh, to be ready for that weekend. And the Thursday before Thanksgiving, which was, you know, right before Black Friday, um, I get a call at two in the morning from one of my uh, managers of the building who tells me that, were somehow the power went out and nobody knows what's going on. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'll try to call an emergency electrician. This is the day before Thanksgiving. So nobody's available. Um, you know, it, it, it took us, I think over almost the next morning, I think. So we had to let everybody go home. The next morning, the electrician came in and said, Hey guys, like the, the transformer burned down. Uh, there's nothing we can do and everything is closed until Monday. So I'm not going to be able to get you a replacement. And we're like, well, we can't be close till Monday. We're going to go out of business. We're going to have so many orders. If we're not processing, it's just not possible. And so we, all of the management team basically got together um, on Thanksgiving, which was unfortunate. Um, and we had to come up with a plan of, you know, how do we, how do we solve this? Like, what do we do to figure it out? And anything was an option at that point. It was kind of like, it was, you know, the, our life was like our business life was on the line in, in a way. Um, and so, you know, we all got together and we ended up basically going to all the department stores uh, or like Home Depot type stores in the area, um, ended up buying a couple thousand feet of um, tens of thousands of feet of extension cords and ran them from other warehouse next door, basically to our facility to supply power to the lights, the, the internet, the packing stations, the, everything. Um, I mean, it looked ridiculous in the warehouse. It was like thousands of cords everywhere, but it was the only way. And it took us the whole night on Thursday night to get this done. Um, and then, you know, we started operating on Friday morning and got, um, although we did get a one day delay, we were still able to gate, get all the orders out. And we operated in kind of a limited capacity, but it was, it was still something that, um, you know, when have we not done that? If we had the kind of a typical team where they were like, Hey, my shift's over, I'm going home, um, attitude, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here. And those are the kind of people that you need. It's like the guys that, um, you know, the people that just stand up if there's a problem and they come and they help and they, they, they put their brains to work to come up with the best possible solution for the business. You know, a lot of organizations have to go through certain things like this, but Jan, you just described to me 
a very difficult you know, problem or challenge that it took not just your brain to solve it. It probably took a lot of people. How do you encourage people to think for themselves and really take a chance by sharing those ideas? So I think one of the things we use uh, uh, OKRs as our leadership tool or, or kind of alignment with, uh, with different, you know, among different levels of management, um, which allows us to align people to what the overall value or goal is for the company. Um, and as long, as long as they understand where their, the company is going, we give them a lot of freedom to operate within their own little box. Um, so instead of you know, us micromanaging and trying to figure out exactly what they're, what they're doing, we give them the objectives of what they're kind of what the big goal is for the business and then um, overall give them the guidance on, okay, well, this is where you know, this is where we're all going and this is where um, whatever decision you make, just make sure it's aligned with your objective. And so giving them that freedom uh, and opportunity to make their own decisions, I think drives uh, that behavior by nature. And also, obviously, you got to be hiring people that have meant, you know, that, that are capable of doing it themselves and not, you know, they don't need handholding to, to get this stuff done. So I know that's easily said, like hire people that don't need handholding, but is there anything specifically that you do that you could share with us? Um, I mean, I think, I think, you know, soon enough, like we tend to, um, we tend to delegate a lot of tasks or projects on kind of a broad spectrum and, and give people the ability to show what they, what they want to do. Um, and, and work with them a lot, like depending on the importance of the project and the expertise level of whoever's managing the project, um, you know, we get to get more involved in, or less involved with, uh, with the project itself. And, uh, if it's something where, you know, we, maybe the, we allow the people to fail as well. Right. So we kind of watch how they're doing it. Uh, what are some of the things that they're taking to, to get it accomplished and, um, and then make sure that it's aligned with what the ultimate goal is. Like there's no, I don't think there's like a silver bullet solution saying, okay, well we, you know, these, these are the exact people that we're hiring, uh, to, to get this done. I think it takes a little bit of trial and error. Um, and, you know, I don't think we're perfect in this either, but I think the, the most important thing is just, you know, have people buy into the, 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 the mission and the vision of the company, communicate what that is, and then kind of huddle around whatever that is, and then make sure that people act on behalf of whatever that vision is for the business. Um, and you can very early on tell whether somebody's following that mindset or not. You know, you have um, probably not that familiar with my work, and I you know, speak on stages around uh, one particular topic, and it's really about how do you inspire employees to take ownership of their work? All the things you just mentioned, like being okay with failure, make decisions for themselves, and, and really just, you know, get shit done um, is really about them taking ownership, even if they don't have a slice of the pie or profit sharing and whatnot, would you agree that taking ownership is a real key factor to your growth? Yeah, hundred percent. And I, you know, and I, we kind of talk about it with my team a lot. I, I think it gets harder and harder uh, the bigger the organization get is to communicate and, and make sure that it gets kind of transferred to all the, um, all pieces of the organization. So it's not just on the management level, but it's on the individual, in our case, um, an associate level in the warehouse understands why we're doing it and, and, and what we're doing it for. Um, and it's easier said than done. I mean, it's, it's definitely a complex subject to maintain the culture and make sure that like everybody knows exactly where the company's going and what, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, but I think it's, it's, I definitely agree that having like knowing what those things are that make people care, um, make the organization perform much higher than uh, if people are just going in and out to, you know, to punch in and out. Now, Jan just talked about ownership. I asked the question, but he followed up with the need for people to feel like owners. Now, I want you to really think about that. I choose those words wisely because they need to feel like owners. Another way to look about this is they need to feel like that you're encouraging the entrepreneur spirit. You want them to feel like they can be resourceful and add value, that they can think for themselves, they can, it's okay to fail. You don't want them to play safe and not take the risk necessary for them to grow the business and share the things that are uh, going to grow the business because that will keep you from growing. 
You want to encourage that entrepreneur spirit. You want to encourage that sense or feeling of ownership in everything you do. If you want to get more information about that, I want you to find an infographic that I created. Just go to genehammock.com forward slash infographic. It's from the study I did uh, about 16 months ago where I was interviewing 53 executives of Inc. 5,000 level companies just like you to figure out why are they growing so fast? What are the core elements? And I organized that in the data. So it's in one page. Go to genehammock.com forward slash infographic. Now back to the interview. You wouldn't have been able to grow to where you are if you just had the kind of people that just punch in and out and, and work their quote unquote job, right? Right. Yep. hundred percent. When you think about leadership, is there anything that you do that you, that you notice might be a little bit different or counterintuitive to what others do in leadership that has allowed this kind of growth? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the one thing is I, I try to, and I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but, um, you know, when, when I started the business, I tend to be, um, you know, I, I try to be very friendly with, with the employees and, and I try to talk to everybody in the business, not just the people that report to me, but I try to walk around and talk to individual employees and try to understand the problems from within the organization, not just the, the information that gets passed over to me. Um, and I try to maintain an image of an open like like a person that everybody can feel like they can come to me with any kind of problems um or where if they feel like we're not doing something right as a business then they can communicate it to me we have a lot of open channels of communication and feedback from our employees to understand if um if they feel like there's a problem or if they feel like we're not doing something right it's like we always try to know um because it does get obviously harder and harder to um you know know every employee and find the time to, to speak to everybody um so I would say that's one of the things that we're doing. And we're also doing like a lot of, uh, we're trying to build a great community of employees and, and, and just like create a really fun culture. Um, so we do, you know, we do happy hours a couple times a month. We do, uh, we have a lot of, like we have a trampoline, we have a ping pong table, we have a uh, billiard. Like we have like a ton of different activities. We throw events um, for our employees. And, and when you put people in a non-work environment um, with their coworkers on weekly basis or monthly basis, we feel like it kind of sparks conversations that maybe people otherwise wouldn't be comfortable having. So, you know, if somebody really wants to complain about something, but they're just too afraid that, you know, their boss is going to see them going in somebody else's office. Like there's ways like in this less formal settings, people are more likely to share their concerns and, and worries. Um, than if it's, you know, kind of like a one-on-one -on -one scheduled meeting sometimes. So I, I think that's been working pretty well for us because people love to work here and they love to be part of these fun events and, and that just kind of makes them closer as a team and, and makes them closer to us uh, as their managers and supervisors. I want to zero in on that, that piece around, you know, giving them space to actually share what's, what's on their mind, the problems they may be going through or the experience. Um, is there anything specific that has generated that has changed the way you guys create culture or operate the business? Um, so in general we have, so we're using, um, you know, like Slack has been a big part of our communication strategy and as a company. And so uh, we have a lot of different channels that are especially like sp very special for focus on whether it's issues from customers or whether it's issues from employees. And, and sparking the conversation and asking people on a regular basis, like, hey, if you were to pick one product feature that you could build tomorrow, what would that be and why? Um, kind of sparking that conversation, having people like, give them, them the freedom to think about it and giving them the ability to contribute to the overall product roadmap is, I think has been a pretty significant uh, value to us because everybody knows that, you know, just because like, just, there's a lot of things that I'm not doing on a daily basis that you know, somebody in customer support might do. So I'll never see that issue or error or customer complaint. But if we give them the platform to present and, and, and give feedback, which they do through Slack or Asana or other, any other tools that we're using, um, I think that creates, you know, it gives us a better understanding of what's going on inside of the business. And it gives them the feeling like they're actually contributing to the overall um, product vision or uh, whatever the other issue is, like whether it's an issue with, you know, the product or the customer or their coworkers, you know, it's a, it's a pretty open platform to share uh, whatever they feel like. 
I want to wrap this up with, you know, maybe just looking back at a mistake that you made in, in the fast growth that you could share to other leaders. Um, and then, you know, how has that transformed the way you think about growing the business? Yeah, I think the biggest mistake I made um, was I didn't hire senior executives early enough. Um, so there's different, I mean, there's certain executives that um, maybe are not at, or especially for our business, because we're so operationally heavy, operationally, like everything we do is operations, the warehouse, you know, it's just a lot of operational things. And uh, we haven't hired a senior uh, operations executives until now, basically. Um, and it's been, I think that's been one of the challenge has been the fact that we didn't really have anybody that knows how to manage a 300 or 400 person organization. And, you know, if I could hire them a year ago, uh, it obviously would have been a lot more expensive because we wouldn't have the money that we, we have now, but it, it would have prevented, I think, a lot of the scaling issues that we've gone through. Um, and, you know, they probably could have thought of a lot of ways to prevent the situation, for example, that happened in, um, uh, during Thanksgiving. So I think those are little things that like having the right infrastructure in place early enough uh, is something that I probably would have done if I could do it again. It's just hire the people that you feel like you need earlier than you well, I appreciate need. you sharing that with us. I wanted to say thank you for being here, sharing your insights around growth and leadership. So uh, Jan, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Wow. What a great interview. I really love talking about you know, fast growth companies and seeing how they think. And I, I don't know if you saw the wheels turning there. I was scribbling down notes because a lot of the things were really smart as far as how they're growing and how they're really creating leadership inside the organization. I don't know if you picked up on it, but one of the things that I really wanted to shine a light on here is they really have people that go beyond just the nine to five or beyond just their core job responsibility. They're willing to share their ideas. They're willing to um, get real and, and really that's what helps them grow. So that kind of leadership is really something to admire. If you want to continue to get these kind of messages right inside your phone or right inside your uh, website, then make sure you go to growththinktank.com or you can subscribe at any of the platforms that are right for you depending on your type of phone. You can always go to growththinktank.com and you can always share it with someone that you feel like would really benefit from these conversations. So I really appreciate you being here a part of this, continue with us down this journey to be a better leader, to create more um, leaders inside your organization, and to lead with courage. We'll see you next time.